Before I commence my speech, I want to make a statement about the situation in the Middle East. The slaughter of more than 30,000 innocent people, including children and the unborn in Gaza, is nothing less than genocide. should be arrested and jailed for life. Yeah. It, is, it is terrible that the fascist state of Israel has continuously bombed and shelled Gaza, the West Bank and East Jerusalem for nearly five months. These territories are the land of the Palestine which Israel has unlawfully occupied since 1967. And unless Israel withdraws, I call upon other nations to force back this fascist state. If the United States, the United Kingdom, can unlawfully invade states like Grenada, Iraq, or Libya, they shall be part and parcel of a force together with all the Arab states driving Israel physically back from the occupied territories of South Israel. Today I'm here to honor miners and their families who in 1984-1985 fought the greatest workers' fight since the days of the Chartists and the Paul Pool Martyrs to save jobs, pits and communities. I especially want to pay tribute to the young miners in 1984 and 1985, who in every sense fought for the future. And of course, like Bernard, I want to pay especially tribute, tribute to the magnificent Women Against Pit Closures, who were at the forefront of our struggle. for those who were there, because it's never been fully shown on television or in film. But on the 12th of May 1984, I recall being part and parcel of the planning of trying to bring together these brave women who had established support groups in every coal field bringing them together in one national body. That was done on the 12th of May, when in Barnsley, South Yorkshire, we staged the march. More important, they staged the march. I confess that I anticipated if we were lucky 500 would appear. I arrived from a meeting with the government appointed National Coal Board to greet them. I couldn't believe my eyes. 10,000 women were covering an area in Barnsley. The route that the march was to take had been planned by the police. But of course, swimming didn't do what men <laughs> always do. And they told the deputy chief constable, we're not going that way, we're going that way. <laughs> and he said, 
that that's the centre of town. That's the reason we're going that way. <laughs> they marched, and as we came to the public hall, not only did we fill it, or they fill it, over 3,000 people packed in, an equal number outside, but on arrival, they were told by the assistant chief constable, oh, you can't bring banners into this place. <laughs> they just brushed him aside and carried the banners in. There were only two people who were male allowed into the meeting. Jack Taylor, the president in Yorkshire, and myself. And as we got to the podium, we were approached by the police and the fire brigade. We were told, do you realize that you're breaking the law? There are too many people. I looked around, I said, if you're asking me to tell them <laughs> to go out, <laughs> you've got another thing coming. <laughs> but if you want to try it, try it. <laughs> You'll lose. <laughs> that particular piece of police officer had a grain of intelligence. <laughs> he said, I note the points you've made and I will give you time to vacate the hall. He said, it's 12 o'clock and I want to see this hall completely empty by six. <laughs> <laughs> closures. A lot of them unfortunately no longer with us. They were magnificent. For the first time we had women in attendance who never left a little village. But here they were exercising for the first time their right to be equal to men and more important to support men who were on strike. The miners' strike of 1984-1985 brought our union unprecedented support from workers in countries all over the world. We reminded all of the people, including the Tory government, that we had a right to strike in accordance with the United Nations Labour Organisation Conventions 87 and 98. We had support, irrespective of all their attempts to stop us, of receiving from people in France, Spain, Italy, Hungary, East Germany, Ireland, South Africa, yes, the Soviet Union, and all the Eastern Bloc countries. And on Christmas, when people in the media say it was the bleakest time in the world for families, I can recall it was one of the most proudest moments and the happiest moments I've been in. Yes. When I saw about 40 juggernauts rolling into Britain, all the honing for a change by the dockers, they brought food medical supplies and a Christmas, Christmas present for every child of a striking miner. 
and the women were magnificent. One of the most interesting things, we had the leading bands in Britain, the leading soloists being late for their concerts to come and perform before them. We had some of the best and they didn't want to go. It was a great day and I'll never forget it. The French Fiji team were magnificent. They primarily did things that were against the law. Boatloads of coal loaded in France, coming from different parts of the East, suddenly got sunk in the same. <laughs> in other words, the exercise the picket right to stop them. Yeah. Like hundreds of thousands of trade union and labour movements, they provided support for us throughout that dispute. It's often been said in the smears that have been made against certainly one leader of the NUM, where, what we got, where we got it, despite the fact that everywhere we went, we were exonerated. But we raised over 10 billion pounds in money that was distributed to every area in the British coal field. Like hundreds and thousands, in the trade union movement they provided for us throughout the dispute. Forty years ago, the Tory government, led by Margaret Thatcher, I agree, declared war on the NUM. They'd been preparing for a showdown with the union since before the 1979 general election. They couldn't forget the victorious minor strikes of 1969, 1972, and 1974. And no, I haven't made a mistake. In 1969, we had an unofficial strike, no ballot, no conference decision, in support of surface workers having the right to an eight-hour day. We won it. In 1972, I had an experience that I lived with for the rest of my life. I went down to a coke depot in Birmingham. I couldn't understand why pickets couldn't just stop. A small picket line yeah, was all we needed for a coke depot. So I got there. It was like Mount, Mount Everest. For four days, the miners from different parts but primarily Yorkshire and South Wales fought and by the way I got arrested but by Tuesday it became apparent to me that something had to be done and I addressed no fewer than 13 meetings in one evening and I asked the movement in Birmingham, don't give us sympathy, don't give us pound notes, important though they are, what we want is you to come out on strike and join the picket line. And the lad who led them, Arthur Harper, said, when do you want us there, brother? And I said Thursday. 
<laughs> and on Thursday, for the finest, most fantastic thing I've ever seen, 20,000 Birmingham workers down tools and join the miners in the greatest victory of all. Determined it would never happen again. Of course, she also remembered that in 1974 we didn't only bring down the government in dead pay policy, we brought them down completely. I think this is when I strike. <laughs> It's often been said that the miners failed in 1984 and 95 because we didn't have a ballot. It was an unlawful act. It's a lie. We took action in accordance with our rules. And Rule 41 gives an area the right when it's under attack to take industrial action. And therefore we called a special conference in October 1983. The miners' dispute didn't begin in March 1984 and for the benefit of a representative from the sun, if one scrap crept in, crept in. <laughs> 1983 is before 1984. <laughs> they, they said it's the wrong time of the year to have a strike in March. Well, we started it in November. And at that conference, Unanimously, unanimously, we voted to have a national overtime ban. It was a success. Within a period of four months, we had reduced the stocks of coal in practically every area, including power stations, ports, steelworks, and other organisations. But it wasn't enough because the coal board, under government instructions, intended to try and destroy the union. On March the 1st, the National Coal Board directors in four areas announced the immediate closure of five pits. Horton Wood and Bulcliffe Wood in Yorkshire, Harrington in Durham, Snowdown in Kent, and Palmaise in Scotland. <coughs> On Tuesday the 6th of March, the act that they brought in to run the coal board, I'm talking about that. I'll Avoid swearing, <laughs> <laughs> confirmed a further 20 would be closed. That decision was unanimous. At the National Executive Committee meeting, two days later, Scotland and Yorkshire sought endorsement in accordance with the rule for permission to take action. They were given authority. <coughs> Within a week, we had 180,000 miners on strike. All of them taking decisions within the area by a show of hands <coughs> in meetings. I'm fed up of reading and listening to critics who say we picked the wrong time of the year. What better time 
to start an industrial dispute in an industry that provided heat and warmth the November of a year. I say that simply to put the record straight. We have, we have a course from March to start picketing on a wider scale. We have a special national delegate conference. And I want to pay tribute to the way that that was run and the decision that was taken. On the 19th of April, 1984, for any historian that's here, delegates rejected a call for a national strike ballot. It was debated and put to the vote. And the vote in the conference was to support the 180,000 or 80% of Britain's miners who were already on strike in accordance with National Rule 41. <coughs> but we also had to pick targets. I haven't said this before, but I'll say it now. I was convinced that the steel industry should be the area's main packaging target. Far more important than power stations, and far more important than other targets such as going to Nottingham. <coughs> important though they were. I didn't just pluck that idea out of the air. I had information from a minister a minister in the Tory government, what, what the position was. The television <coughs> and radio broadcasts were telling people that they had up to nine months supply. It wasn't that, but it didn't matter. Because I knew that at the steel plant they'd only got three weeks. And I know that had we had mass picketing from the start, at picketing targets in Raymond Sprague in Scotland, Port Talbot in Wales, and Scunthorpe in Yorkshire, that strike could have been over within two months. <coughs> who, who supports that? Ironically, and I don't ask you to buy it for God's sake, Thatcher's autobiography. She admits the only three weeks supply. And at all costs, she says, we had to do everything we had in our armory to defeat the NUM. She devoted in her autobiography a whole chapter to me. <laughs> I think she fancied me. <laughs> began to realise there was only one way to stop it. And stop it, we did. And I'll tell you why in a minute. The decision of the Mining Union on the 19th of April 
advise that areas that picketing must be confined on an area basis. Because we knew it was both legal and morally right. It was obvious that if we could mas master enough pickets, in this case in Orgreave, we could have a chance. What's not all already known is that at Orgreave, it didn't start on the 18th of June, it started on the 23rd of May. I know because I was there. I've always believed that a leader of a trade union shouldn't sit, just sit in an office. He should be at the front and going to the point of production or the point of conflict. A principle I've kept all my life. Which And we arrived at a situation where on the 27th of May we had a mass picket. Not as large as the 18th of June would be, but nevertheless one that terrified the authorities. My contact in the ministry told me that the consideration of being given to deploying large numbers of police from all police forces and if necessary in employ the army. I'm fed up of reading and listening to historians and media experts saying we walked into a trap yeah. or that the welcomed us with open arms. Well, if that's the case, somebody's got to explain to me why they arrested me on the 30th of May. Not exactly a welcome, but by the time we reached the 18th of June, we had thousands of people at Aubrey from all over Britain. It was a <coughs> magnificent display. By the way, we were not kettled, and certainly couldn't have been, in an area with about 10 acres of land. But we had a military police force armed to the teeth with staves, truncheons, dogs, shields, long shields, short shields. And boy, did they intend to use them. The, the things that you've seen on television are only part of the story. The BBC, for example, who filmed that night, turned the film round yeah. to purport that the miners had charged into police lines. It's a lie. The miners will be battered, and I mean battered, in a way that one could not believe, and hasn't happened certainly since the 1980s. Of course, police numbers grew. By the 30th of May, they knew that we were meaning business. But the planning for the 30th of May appeared <coughs> in insignificance alongside the mass picking on the 18th of June. The planning was broadcast to the world. And I personally acquired from a small old shop down in back from part of Sheffield some walkie talkies. I've got about eight. And I was shown how to operate them because electronically I'm a failure. <laughs> it's that two switches. One and two. 
Dave Douglas was given one in a meeting and told where to, to stand. One was given to the Yorkshire Miners Vice President and others to other pickets. And we could com communicate across this mass picket. We knew it was a matter of time before they clicked and got their technology working. But it took them two hours to find out how we were working. <laughs> and they managed to jam it. So we all, in accordance with pre plan, switched to, switched to. That lasted for about 15 minutes, and then they blocked that. But during that time, pickets were doing an amazing job. We were, we were standing firm. And in particular, Dave Douglas and the miners from Hatfield yes. occup occupied, they, they occupied the plant. And they only wish they'd have stayed in. But it was an indication that we were not being battered all the time into submission, we were fighting back. And I'll tell you this, if people are charging into members of my union and hitting them with truncheons and shields, I'll advise them to fight back and not simply take punishment. Unconscious on 18th of June, and the chief constable, as assistant chief constable, told the world I had slipped down a bank <laughs> and injured myself. And in a, at least one biography, the author said I was treated by the say, local brigade to help people in trouble. Paul Foote, no longer with us, came to interview me and he said in that distinctive voice, you see, what we really need is some photographic evidence. We need a photograph of Arthur being hit. And this lad who was with me, we had six witnesses, but no camera. The cameras had been kept back by the police. <coughs> this lad said, from South Kirby. He said, I, I took a picture. <coughs> Paul said, yeah, yes, but I'm talking about a picture of Arthur Skager getting hit. He said, I took a picture. He said, can you go and get it developed? He said, I've developed it. I said, can you go on and get it? He said, I've got it. He said, well, why didn't you publish it? He said, I didn't think it was good enough. Oh, said, I can't believe it. I've got the original, by the way. And the people around me, including the guy, who hit me with the bloody shield is a, as clear as crystal. And I finished up in hospital together with hundreds of others, 95 who were really badly hurt. 95, by the way, who were charged with riot. I, I read that if issued, means life imprisonment. Michael Mansfield, representing the NUM, went to court and he was in possession of all the data that I was able to provide. And he cross-examined this assistant chief constable. And he said to him, how did you know that Mr. Scargill slipped down a bank? 
He said, I was told so. So Mansfield said, that's hearsay evidence. He said, my officers don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> and Mansfield says, we shall see. Yeah. The next one on was the police officer who had said in another case uh, he'd been hit, he had hit this man at 8 a.m. And Mansfield said, could you be mistaken? Could it be a 5 to 8? No, 8. Mike Mansfield said, but, but could it be 5 past? No, eight. He said, could I have a look at your notebook? The judge says, you've got to give it. So Mansfield opened the notebook of the police officer. He said, I'm going to read it. 7.15, Aubrey. 7.40, admission that there is police violence on the day. And then this. 8 a.m. Police station canteen. Have a breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> he said, could you please explain to me and the judge how you could be arresting this man and at the same time I'm having a nice breakfast 15 mile away in the police headquarters and the judge said I'm stopping this at this point he said you might be facing perjury but in any event the case is dismissed and eventually of course all of them are dismissed just like, just like Hillsborough it took them 50 years to get the truth. Uh, I know exactly how they worked. A very close friend of mine is Ricky Tomlinson. And I've spoken all over Britain. The facts are often repeated in media accounts of the Battle of Aubrey. But what is not reported, apart from two accounts, one from me, one from Dave Douglas in his book, Ghost Dancers. He said the police were forced to close the plant. And that they did on the 18th of June. I can confirm it because Nicholas Jones, the BBC Labour correspondent, handed me a copy of the telex from Haslam, the chairman of British Steel, closing the plant for that day. It was almost a replica of what had happened all those years before at Saldigay. But instead of repeating that by bringing more pickets, as I urged from my hospital bed, the areas for some reason didn't do it. I say reluctantly because I've got every faith in the miners who were there. They were courageous. A lot of them very badly hurt. You know, people on oxygen machines in the hospital where I was. As it happened, I've no doubt in my mind that if Orgreave had stayed closed on the 19th and onwards, the strike would have been over. For 40 years I've been accused of refusing to negotiate. Well, that's a lie as well. We met on five occasions and reached what we understood to be a deal that we could put to our members. 
what happened was contact was made by McGregor to David Hart and to Thatcher and the deal was stopped. It's a fact. And the 2014 disclosure of downstream minutes demonstrates it was a, a lie. <coughs> Who also stayed closed had, had it been for a, the effect of something else far more important. We agreed to go to ACAS in order to try and negotiate a settlement in October 1984. The most important part of our agreement was to be to protect jobs of miners, families and of course keep the pits open. We decided to approach the NACODs, that's the Deputy's Trade Union, who just had a ballot with a majority of 83%, and were in the same building in an upstairs room. And Magaki said, well, why don't we present a proposal and ask them agree to agree? So we did. And I can tell you, I wrote it in my own, my own handwriting. And uh, that result, had it been accepted, would have won the strike. So you have a right to know what it was. I approached Nacons and they agreed Word for word, these words that I wrote, quotes, that the NCB withdraw its pit closure plan, give an undertaking that the five collieries earmarked for immediate closure will be kept open, and guarantee that no pit would be closed unless by joint agreement it was deemed to be exhausted or unsafe." Unquote. This proposal was accepted by NACODS and accepted, ironically, by the Conciliation Service ACAS. It was then submitted to the adjoining room where the National Cold War were. Before I had a chance to even read it, McGregor says, I'm off. I'm not participating. And they, they just left the building. And so there was going to be a strike at every pit in Britain on the following week. And I knew and they knew that that would be enough to win the strike. And again, I refer you, please don't buy the book, but get hold of Thatcher's autobiography <laughs> and Peter Walker, the Energy Secretary's autobiography. They both admit that they couldn't have carried on. And in fact, the minister who had become a friend of mine for industrial purposes confirmed to me that they discussed in cabinet that they couldn't carry on, they would have to settle. But something strange happened. Two days before the meeting in ACAS to settle the agreement, NACODS told us that they changed their mind. It was ironic because for the first time in my history, the TUC urged them to carry on and go on strike. I've never known it before. <laughs> we were saying to them, we've got a proposal that ACAS can live with. That the government 
want to live with. So why pull out? And to this day, I've never had an answer. But their decision to be betray that agreement led to the Tories deciding to carry on. And they, they said, we want have to carry on if it takes a year. But in 1985, it's significant that even then, they were beginning to run out of coal, even for power stations, despite the fact that they were receiving coal from places like Poland, who should have been be no better. But no explanation has ever been given as to why NACOD's performed this sellout, which had terrible consequences, which led to the destruction of the whole of Britain's deep mine coal and industry. So all of those in Nottingham and South Derbyshire and Leicestershire, with the exception of those courageous miners who ignored the decision to keep working, yes. were on strike. Yes. Had a right to know that victory was in our hand and taken away by a decision of the deputies' union. And as they carried on, they also knew that the chairman of the CGB, that was a power generating board, had confided, and again, taken from me, I know, that they couldn't carry on for another three months because the stocks were in low even at the power stations. Over the, over the years I've repeatedly said, we didn't come close to winning. We did win. We'd won in October with the deputies as they stood by the agreement. We would have won had the areas inexplicably decided not to increase the number of pickets after the 18th of June. And it led to a bizarre, bizarre situation. And you've got a right to know, not just commemorate, which is really important. But on the 21st of February, 1985, we held a special delegate conference. And on the basis of much of what I've just told you, I explained to that conference, and they decided unanimously to carry on with the strike. Within five days, exactly by 28th of February, five areas had written in asking for a recall conference to agree to an immediate return to work without a settlement. Now, it takes some thinking through. Why would they vote on the 21st of February to carry on with the strike and five days later change their minds? Not just in one area, but in five different areas, including, of course, primarily South Wales. I've never understood it. I've never understood the thinking or the forces behind it, whether they were working for the union in those areas or whether they were being supported by MPs in form in those areas. That conference led to a special conference on the 3rd of March, 1985. The NEC position was for a continuation of the strike. The resolution to call off the strike was put to the executive committee. And we explained that the conference decision that had taken place on the 21st of February bounded 
to support our members who have fought for brave, in bravery for a year. We decided to recommend, make no recommendation. We went into the hall of the TUC and from the floor these areas were voted to consider calling off the strike and going back to work. Five areas. It was put to the vote that the NEC should be compelled to take a decision. We had in the middle of the conference to have an adjournment and we met again. And the vote was for a return to work 12, for continuation of the strike 12. The vote to go back to work was 12. The vote against was 12. And I've often been asked, including by my grandson, when he was writing for his thesis at university, why didn't you cast a vote? I said, because I understood what was taking place. The idea was simple. If I had cast a vote in favour of going back to work, the miners would never have forgiven me. And I could never have held my head up again. Yeah. Mm. Secondly, if I didn't cast a vote, it means that they had to move it. And I told them that the areas who wanted it had to move it. And the stain of doing that would be theirs and not mine. The three, the three, the three national officials, again for the history books, the three national officials supported the decision to remain on strike till we won. Magaki, Heathfield and Scargill. We refused to call off the strike. And the vote was 98 votes to 91. Seven votes in it. And that meant we had no alternative but to obey our own rule. <coughs> Today, my job is a simple one. It is to say to you how privileged I was to be a part of that historic event. <coughs> For a year and four months, the miners of Britain fought a battle that was alongside the greatest battles in history. It was alongside the battles of the Chartists, the Diggers, yes, and the Tall Puddle Masters. And history will judge who was right and who was wrong. Above all, it will also result in doing what you have already heard about the magnificent women against big closures who stood up. And I'll tell you this, if it had been left to the women to vote, we'd still be on strike. <laughs> It's a privilege to be here today 
40 years on from the most historic dispute in a century. It's a privilege to talk to you and to thank you for what you did. Not only the men and women involved, but to their children, a lot of them who are here today as adults. I tell you what you did and what you've done. You marched into history and you've entered the pantheon of working class heroes and heroines.